You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Parsha Review Podcast. All right, welcome back, my friends, to another installment in the Parsha Review, the weekly Parsha Review. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Nusso. It is the second portion in the book of Numbers, in the book of Bamidbar, 35th portion since the beginning of the Torah. It is the longest Parsha in the Torah, with 176 verses, 2,264 words, and 8,632 letters. There are 18 mitzvahs in this week's Parsha, 7 performative and 11 prohibitions. This week's Parsha, Parsha's Nasso, always falls out after the holiday of Shavuos. So, this week's Parsha begins with the assignments, the tasks, and transporting responsibilities of the Levite families are described. The Kahas family, we remember from last week's Torah portion, they handled the vessels, the ark, the table, the menorah, the altars, as explained previously. Gershon family, the Gershon, because they were Gershon, Kahas, and Merari, were the children of Levi, and each family had their own responsibilities. So the the Gershon family handled the fabrics, the curtains, the tapestries, and the roof coverings. The Merari family handled the structural components the boards, the beams, the pillars, the bolts, the sockets for the walls for the structure. Moshe concludes his census with a count of the Levites, ages 30 to 50, with a total of 8,580 men suitable for the work in the temple. Now, you can multiply that with the women, add the children and young adults who are under the age of 30, and people over the age of 50, there were many Levites. Then Hashem commands the purification of the camp. Hashem commands that anyone ritually impure, through tzaras, what we called the loose translation of leprosy, or a certain discharge called a zav, or someone who comes in contact with the dead, with a corpse, they must be removed from the camp. Then the Torah tells us, interestingly, about treachery or theft where someone holds on to the money of another Jew, either a loan that they didn't repay, theft, or they're holding on to employee wages, and denies it with a vow, must repay, once it's brought to light the the truth of the matter, they must repay with an extra fifth added to it. If the person owed was a convert, but now the convert died and he has no heirs, He has no one to inherit his money. So who does the money go to? He's trying to repay it to this convert. The person repays to the Kohen and must bring a special offering. Then in this week's Parsha, the Torah goes into this special commandment of the Sota. What is the Sota? If a woman is accused by her husband of being unfaithful with no witnesses, he brings her to the Kohen, offers a jealousy offering for her. She stands before the court and is urged to admit her guilt. If she denies, she drinks a bitter water potion. If she is guilty, she would die an unusual death. If innocent, she will be blessed incredibly. The Nazir is then discussed. A man or woman who vow abstinence for the sake of Hashem, they must abstain for at least 30 days from drinking grape products, cutting any here, nor become impure through contact with a corpse. Upon completion of the period of sanctity and devotion, the Nazir shaves his head and brings a sin offering and a peace offering. Then the Torah tells us in this week's parsha about the priestly blessing. Hashem commands the Kohanim, the, all the Kohanim from the tribe of Levi, to bless the Jewish people. Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha, may Hashem bless you and safeguard you. Ya'er Hashem panava elecha v'chuneka, may Hashem illuminate his countenance for you. And be gracious to you. Yisa Hashem panavelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. Then there's the gifts of the leaders. To celebrate the inauguration of the Mishkan on the first day of Nisan, in the year following the Exodus, the leaders of the tribes donated gifts, wagons and oxen, to assist the Levites with the transportation of the tabernacle. Moshe distributed them as needed to each of the families that were involved with the transportation, the Gershon, Kahas, and Merari families. 
the leaders desired to bring offerings, and Hashem commanded Moshe that each tribe should offer a sacrifice one liter per day. So each of the first 12 days of the month of Nisan, a different tribe brought their offerings in the brand new inaugurated tabernacle. They were offered in this order. Day one was Yehuda, day two Yisachar, day three Zavulun, day four Reuven, day five Shimon, day six Gad, day seven Ephraim, day eight Menashe, day nine Binyamin, day ten Dan, day eleven Asher, and day twelve Naphtali. Together with their unique offerings, each leader donated gifts of gold and silver, animal and meal offerings. The total of all the gifts are listed in chapter 7, verse 84 to verse 88. Then Hashem communicates with Moshe. When Moshe arrives at the tent of meeting, he hears Hashem call him from atop the cover upon the ark of testimony from between the two cherubs. And that is where our parsha concludes. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to discuss some of the important lessons from this week's parsha. Number one, last week we mentioned, if you turn over your sheet, you'll notice that where Moshe and Aaron were, where they were camped on the east, Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zavulun are right next to them. Those three tribes camped next to them. And our sages tell us that when you have a righteous neighbor, you will be influenced righteously. When you have a good neighbor, you'll be influenced with goodness. And Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zavulun are the three tribes that had the most, most of the virtues of Torah study and the qualities of leadership were among those tribes. So that we mentioned last week. But if you look at the south side, you'll see Kahas. Who was part of the tribe of Kahas? Korach. And Korach was a negative influence. And we see that some of those tribes were influenced by Korach and ultimately fell, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, Torah portion. They fell to the trap of Korach and were negatively influenced. And our sages teach us it is so important for us to be cautious of our influences. Today, more than ever, you can be living in the best neighborhood in the world. You can be living feet away from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you can be right next to the Western Wall, you can be living in the Holy City of Jerusalem, you can be living anywhere, and you have a little device in your hand that can connect you with the worst influences in the world. Our influences are from the things we allow into our lives, and we can never expect that we be in a negative environment and not be influenced. We will always absorb our environment. And when our environment is positive, our influences are positive, we become positive. So it's just another reminder of how important it is for us to always be cautious about our influences. The next idea I'd like to discuss is the concept of holiness. Holiness means to be separated, to be dignified, to be unique. And what we see is that Hashem tells the Jewish people, send the impure away. Be holy because I am holy. We see that Hashem, who does Hashem focus on in his Torah? Who does Hashem focus on in his Torah? Hashem focuses on the positive. Hashem focuses on those who are good. Hashem wants us to learn from those good influences. We see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, Moses. They're the good characters. Those are the ones that Hashem wants us to be involved with. What do we have about Esau? What do we have about Korach? We have a little discussion, and just so that you know what to stay away from. But the emphasis is always on the positive people. Hashem wants us to be sanctified, Hashem wants us to be dignified, and Hashem wants us to be holy and separated from the negative influences. So we see that when we talk about the convert who died and didn't leave over any inheritors, 
the Torah has a specific portion discussing how you repay that debt. And the commentaries explain why is this mentioned here? It's mentioned here to remind us again that Hashem defends the defenseless. When someone doesn't have anyone to defend them, the underdog is always picked up by Hashem. Who's the underdog? Jacob or Esav? Jacob. Who's the underdog? Joseph or his brothers? Joseph. You always find that the underdog is the one who's taken even Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael is older. Isaac is younger. Esav is older. Jacob is younger. Joseph is younger than many of his brothers. Moshe is younger than Aaron. Hashem always chooses the underdog. We have to understand that Hashem's mercy is very, very powerful. And therefore, when there is a defenseless character like a convert or a widow or an orphan, the Torah tells us again and again and again, be very careful. Because if they cry to me, I will listen. I will heed their prayers and their requests. Therefore, it's another reminder for us to be extra cautious. If you know someone who's a widow, you need to use kid gloves near them to ensure that we don't hurt them, insult them, make them feel bad, that they should always feel included and they shouldn't feel left out. Then we see in this week's parsha the incredible story of the Sota. And if you look in the Torah, it says multiple times about jealousy and he was jealous of her. And he brings a jealousy offering. And it's, it's such an incredible portion discussing this allegedly adulterous woman. So we need to know that when we talk about jealousy, there's a good jealousy and there's a bad jealousy. Bad jealousy is when we're jealous of another person's possessions. When we're jealous of what another person's fortune is. Oh, they're smarter than me. Oh, they are. they have a better family than me. Oh, they have more money than me. They have a nicer home than me. That's a terrible, terrible jealousy because that means that we don't understand that everything comes from Hashem. That's a jealousy that's destructive. That's a jealousy that really distances us from the Almighty because instead of us recognizing that everything is from Hashem and if Hashem wanted us to have that sweater, we would have it. If Hashem wanted us to have that car or that husband or that wife, or that child, we would have it. But Hashem chose an exactly perfect path for us and gave us the exact thing that we need in order for us to succeed. Therefore, if a person is jealous of another person, we have to be very, very careful that it be a positive jealousy. What is a positive jealousy? If you're jealous of another person's spirituality, you're jealous of another person's good character traits. You're jealous of another person's education. So what happens? Read more, learn more, grow more, connect more. It says, Kinas Sofrim Tar The Mishnah tells us that the jealousy of Torah will only increase wisdom. So you can open up a synagogue right across the street, no problem. Why? Both synagogues will improve to become better. You can open up a school right next door. You know why? Because both schools will improve and become better. Who's going to benefit at the end? The Almighty will benefit. That kind of jealousy is a good jealousy. So we have to make sure that if we're jealous of another person, we can find a way to not just be jealous and be bitter. Oh, they got the promotion. I didn't. How do I improve myself? How do I become a better person? How do I inspire myself to change and become the person I dream to be. So these two ideas of jealousy, I thought were important for us to discuss because generally when we think of jealousy, we think of it in a negative way. But there's a very positive jealousy that we should hopefully all be inspired from. Then we see the, sto the incredible story of the Sota that she drinks this bitter water potion. What's in this bitter water? They would take the name of Hashem on a parchment, fresh ink, and they would put the name of Hashem into the water. And it's an incredible thing. That water would become this holy, bitter potion. 
and she would drink it. There were other things that were mixed in this water as well. And if she was, and we don't know, nobody knows, only Hashem knows what really happened with her. See, she secluded herself with another man. She's a married woman. And she claims nothing happened. The husband claims in jealousy that something happened. So who's going to who's gonna find out? Well, we'll find out after she drinks. Now they encourage her to admit her guilt. There are things that they do to bring her to a point of sort of to break her down from having this front of like, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. But Hashem is willing to have his own name erased for the sake of peace between a man and his wife, between a husband and a wife. Hashem wants us to be close with our spouses. And therefore Hashem says, erase my name so that there be peace. I want to tell you an amazing story. The Chazon Ish, who was the greatest Torah scholar in the early 1900s, who lived in Israel, he originally came from Europe, and he told someone, that he only answers questions relating to shalom bayit, to peace and harmony in the home. Fights between a husband and wife, those are the types of questions that he would answer. Those are the only types of questions he would bother himself with. And people would ask him, you know, your Torah is so amazing. Your Torah is so valuable. Why are you wasting time answering people with their nonsense questions? He says, no, I only answer questions for marriage-related issues. They said, what are you talking about? We hear people asking you the craziest questions. Should I buy the apartment on the second floor? Should I buy it on the third floor? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I take this job? Should I take that job? What are you talking about? You only answer questions relating to family wholesomeness to shalom by it. He said, no. He says, they only ask those questions to see that they can trust me, to see that, that, that I'm a reliable source. He says, once they feel that I can answer their questions appropriately and that we have a, a, a trust going on here, that's when they bring out the real question. He says, those are just the, the, the buffer questions. Those are just the questions. But it's such an amazing thing that the Chazonish said, if Hashem is willing to erase his name so that a husband and wife have peace, I'm willing to stop learning my Torah so that a husband and wife have peace. That's how important it is. It's paramount importance in Judaism that a husband and wife have peace in their home. Not only that, is that our sages tell us that the relationship between a husband and wife is parallel to the relationship between mankind and God. A person who's married needs to be selfless in order for that marriage to work. In our relationship with God, for that relationship to work, we can't be selfish. We have to be selfless. And the more selfless we are, the more dedicated we are in that relationship with Hashem, the holier, the greater we become. So it's a very important message here to remember the value of a husband and wife being at peace with one another, to find every way possible as a rabbi, as a friend, as a neighbor, as a counselor, as a mentor, to give people the ability to work and perfect themselves. I always say marriage is a workshop in character development. If someone is not ready to work on themselves, don't get married. Get, Torah commands us to get married. That's right. That means you're going to have to work on yourself. You're going to have to overcome challenges. You're going to have to overcome your own preferences. You're going to have to create a new person here, a new, a new entity, a new world. You know, everyone comes from their own family, their own background, their own history, their own habits. Get into a marriage with another person. Suddenly they bring their habits, you bring your habits, and you have to create your own. And if you're going to be all hard-nosed and difficult with one another, not willing to accept and be flexible, then what happens is there's a fight. You know, people. what people like to do many times is they like to find someone who's exactly like them. Oh, we like the same movies and we like the same music and we enjoy the same food and we love to dance and we like the same vacations. So everything's the same and everything is great. So everything is going to be harmony, right? Not necessarily. 
Because sometimes if they're the same, they clash. Sometimes you have to find someone with differences. They like different things. And then when you come together, it creates a peace and harmony that, and a love, a uniqueness that's now a new entity of the two of you together. It's not that you are who you are and you stay who you are. She is who she is and she stays who she is. No. Now you both become a new entity together. And I think it's an important conversation for people to have before they get married. To understand that marriage is not about kumbaya and romance like Disney teaches us. That's not what it's about. What Disney fails to show us is the importance of the struggle, of the challenge, of, yes, those fights, how those bring the bond even stronger. Many people, they get into that fight, and they're one fight, and they're out. Oh, it's not working out. What do you mean it's not working out? You just started. <laughs> it's such an important thing for a person, every person, to understand that marriage is about working through those challenges, working through those differences. All right. The next is that, and this is a very important teaching, that we mentioned at the beginning of each of these Parsha classes how many verses, how many words, how many letters. But one of the most important things we see in the Torah is the order of the portions. Why is one thing mentioned next to the other? And the big question asked is why is the portion of the sota of the adulterous woman right next to the portion of the nazir? Our sages tell us, what is a, an adulterous woman? A woman who got carried away a little. What is a nazir? Someone who abstains from wine, from worldly pleasures. Sages tell us something very incredible. If you see a woman who is accused of having an adulterous affair, you know what you need to do? Stay away from wine. The Torah is telling you, you know what she got carried away from? She probably had a little bit too much wine to drink at the bar. Got carried away. Did something perhaps that she shouldn't have. It's a lesson for you. If you see something, it's a message for you. You know, there's this, a phrase in New York, they say, you see it all over the subways. If you see something, say something. I say, if you see something, it's saying something to you. The Baal Shem Tov tells us, everything you see is a mirror reflecting a message to you. You want to know why you saw someone reacting like that? Why did I need to see it? I could have been two aisles away in the store and not see the parents yelling at their children like that. Maybe it's Hashem putting a mirror in front of me, showing me what I look like if I talk to my children like that. Why did I need to see a certain story on the news of murder, of theft? Maybe it's a mirror that Hashem is showing me that with my words, I can kill people. I need to be more careful. And Today, more than ever, you look at the news, it's crazy what's going on. It's a message for us that we need to take into our lives and apply them. Have there been stories that you just didn't see, you didn't hear about it until weeks later? Yeah, we all miss stories. Why? You don't wonder why certain stories you see, certain stories you don't see. Because it's a mirror. Hashem is telling you, this is the message you need to know, the message you need to see, and this is a message you don't need to see. It's not relevant to you. And therefore, I'm not going to show it to you. Very important for us to know. Everything you see is a message. If you see something, it's saying something. It's a message. And that's what, what we learn from these two portions being juxtaposed, being one right next to the other. The Parsha of the Sota and the Parsha of the Nazir is a message teaching us how to improve our ways. So a very important, a very interesting point that our sages talk about, the commentaries all discuss this. We see that after the Nazir finishes his period of holiness, he brings a sin offering. A sin offering. Here's a guy who says, I want to be holy. I want to abstain myself from all worldly pleasures. 
He has to bring a sin offering. Say, just tell us that God gave us this world to have pleasure, to derive pleasure. You're limiting yourself from pleasures? I told you to enjoy wine. It has to be in moderation, of course. I told you to take care of yourself and look good. Shem gave us beauty. Instead, you're growing out your hair because you want to abstain yourself from that physical beauty as well. It's unbelievable. You're trying to limit what God gave you to enjoy? That's requiring a sin offering. Hashem put us into this world for pleasure. Now, of course, a person needs to be sure and be careful that they're not getting carried away with fraudulent counterfeit pleasures. But we're in this world for pleasure. And when someone abstains from pleasure, that demands a sin offering. Because Hashem, that's not why he put us into this world. He didn't put us into this world to abstain from pleasure. He put us into this world to enjoy the pleasures properly. Also because it's incongruent with Judaism for a person to completely block themselves out from all pleasures, even for a limited amount of time. Torah wants us to take the pleasures of this world and use them appropriately, use them with balance. Everything in Torah is about balance. And if a person has imbalance, which is what a Nazir does, it's an imbalance where he's going to an opposite extreme to connect with holiness. That's something which requires a sin offering. Then we see in this week's portion the priestly blessings that are given daily in Israel and only on festivals in the diaspora. It's an amazing thing. This is the blessing that Jewish parents give to their children. And this is the blessing that the Torah tells us comes from Hashem. People go to great lengths to get blessings from rabbis and get blessings from righteous people. But we have to always remember the blessings come from Hashem. When we go to the tombs of great righteous people, we don't pray to the righteous people. We're not praying to them. We're praying that they be representatives on our behalf in front of the Almighty. Blessing comes from Hashem. The Kohanim are to put Hashem's name on the Jewish people, and Hashem says, and I will bless them. The commandment here is for Hashem to bless the people when the Kohanim put the names of Hashem upon the people. That's what it needs to, that's the way it needs to happen. Not that the Kohen should get carried away like he has some power. The power of blessing is in Hashem's hands. But I want to share with you an amazing story I heard over the holiday of Shavuot. There was a man in New York who would be a regular at the synagogue, an elderly man. The rabbi noticed every holiday, every festival, when they were about to start the blessing of the Kohanim, this guy would dash right out of synagogue. He would leave the synagogue. You know, they start where right by Modim is when everyone starts to prepare. The Kohanim already walk up to the front. This guy heads for the door. So the rabbi figured, you know, it may be this elderly man is eating by someone's house. He's a guest at someone's home. And he's going to be late because the hosts prayed in a different synagogue. So he didn't want to be late. So the rabbi said, you know what? I'm going to invite him next festival. Next holiday, when we have the blessing of the Kohanim, I'm going to invite him to my house, and that way he won't need to rush out, and I'll find out what's going on. Sure enough, the rabbi invites him for the meal on the festival to be at his house. It comes the time for the blessing of the Kohanim, and this guy dashes right out. So after davening, the man is waiting there for the rabbi, and the rabbi They're walking home. The rabbi says, you know, I notice that you dash out every time there's the priestly blessings. What's going on? He says, Rabbi, let me tell you a story. He says, I wouldn't say this, but you asked. He says, when I was in the ghettos, in the concentration camps, he says it was the first night of Pesach. And there was a very righteous, optimistic individual named Yosala. 
And Yosela got everyone together, not everyone, three people. And he says, guys, I made matzah. I hid the matzah. We're going to have a Seder tonight. They said, you're crazy. They catch us, we're dead. He says, we're going to make a Pesach Seder. We're going to thank Hashem for giving us freedom. Freedom, we're here. Look, look where we're at. We're in a barracks. This is freedom. And he goes there, the three individuals, and they have a Pesach Seder, and they eat the matzah, and it's an unbelievable thing. The next day, the second Seder, they had over 200 people there celebrating the Seder. Everyone having a little piece of matzah, a little something to remember, to connect. It says in the middle of the entire telling of the story of Egypt and everyone is getting involved and everyone is suddenly smiling and happy, the door gets kicked open and this Nazi soldier walks in and says, what's going on over here? Who arranged this thing? Nobody says a word. He says, tell me who did this or I kill 50 people right now. Nobody says anything. He says, this is the last chance. So this Yasala stands up and he says, you can do with me what you want, but the Jewish people will always prevail. He says, you know what? I'm not going to kill you now. He says, tomorrow we're going to make a grand scene. We're going to make a podium and we're going to kill you in front of everyone. And indeed, the next day, the second day of Pesach, they bring him up on this podium and everyone from the entire camp is brought out to see how this person is going to be executed. And he asks them before they execute him, he says, can I just say one thing? They said, yeah. He says, my dear friends, today is the holiday of Pesach. It's the second day of Pesach. And in our synagogues, we would have the priestly blessings. I am a Kohen. I would like to, to bless the congregation, to bless you all. And that be my last thing I do on this earth. There he did the priestly blessings. He said the blessing, and he said, And they killed him. And this individual tells the rabbi, he says, I don't want to have any other priestly blessing disturb that vision that I have. That purity, that holiness, that experience. The most incredible blessing of the Kohen ever. Absolutely pure. He says, any other priestly blessing would diminish that feeling that I still have. That's fire within me. It's an unbelievable power that the Kohen has. The Kohen has the ability, put my name on the Jewish people, and Hashem through the Kohen blesses the people. He's a messenger of Hashem. The Kohen themselves don't have the power to bring that blessing to the people. Hashem, through the Kohen, gives that blessing. Hashem should bless us all that we should always be among the recipients of incredible blessing from Hashem. As parents, our obligation is to bless our children. To bless them is a custom to bless your children every Friday night. Many people do so right before Kiddush Friday night. And you know what? If your children don't live in the country, they're far away on the phone. My son calls me from yeshiva every Friday and I bless him over the phone. Do what we can to put the name of Hashem on his fa- on his family, on his children. Hashem will bless them. Then we see Moshe's concern about accepting the gifts of the leaders. We see that the leaders desired to bring offerings. Moshe was very hesitant until Hashem told him, yes, you can accept their offerings, but only one tribe at a time. What was Moshe's concern? So you remember, Nadal and Avihu were very excited to give and to offer in the temple. Moshe was very concerned about that. Moshe was afraid that this was another example of Nadav and Avihu. But when Hashem told him that they're doing it with a pure heart, 
you can accept their gift. Only then did Moshe accept the gifts from the leaders of the tribes. We have to understand that the purity of heart in which we give is what really counts. It's not the numbers you give. It's the purity you give. It's the purity with which you give that counts. What would you prefer? A huge donation with someone who's mad at you or a smaller donation from someone who loves you? It's about the relationship of how you give. It says that a person who gave to the temple with a pure heart, the purer the intention, the holier that money was used for. No one wants to give money to keep the electricity on. Everyone wants to give money for the holy ark, for the gold. Everyone wants to give money for the altar. Everyone wants to give money for the menorah. How do you know what your money was given for? Say, just tell us by the purity of heart is how holy it went. And Hashem knows the intentions of the heart. All right. And then this week's partial, we conclude that Moshe is our representative. And Hashem communicates with Moshe only after the inauguration of the temple, of the Mishkan, only after the Jewish people are taken care of. That's when Moshe can communicate with Hashem. A leader is not meant to have their own self-righteousness, their own self-aggrandizement lead their way or motivate them. It should be taking care of the people first. That's my priority. After the people are taken care of, now I can communicate with Hashem. And we see that only after all of that happened in the temple, everything was taken care of, then we see that Hashem called Moshe and Moshe was able to communicate with Hashem. So my dear friends, this concludes the weekly Parsha review for Parsha Snaso, and I look forward to learning with you next week. Have an amazing Shabbos. So, excellent question. If you remember, we discussed that on the 23rd day of the month of Adar, which was seven days prior to the inauguration of the temple, what happened was is that they did a practice. Those three families, the Gershon, Kahas, and Merari family, did a practice of assembly and disassembly of the tabernacle. Every day they assembled and disassembled, assembled, disassembled. They practiced at putting it together so that it didn't take such a long time. And that way, everything was in order. And you have to understand that each of the beams were numbered. Each of the beams were numbered. So it was numbered one on one side and one on the other, and one and two on the other side. And then two and two were put together. Three and three were put together. Four and four were put together. And then it was erased. And when they disassembled it, they put those numbers back so that when they traveled, the same beam was put in the same place, which is why we know that on the laws of Shabbos, we're not allowed to do anything that was required in the tabernacle. Writing two letters is prohibited in the Torah. Why two letters? Because they needed to write two letters to match the beams, not one letter. One letter is a rabbinic law. But two letters is a biblical prohibition. You're not allowed to write two letters because that was what was required in the tabernacle to put together the beams. Yes. And you also had, like we see in this week's parasha, the leaders of the tribes donated the oxen and the, the wagons that were required to transport those beams. But you know who did not get any of those? The tribe of Kahas. Because the tribe of Kahas were carrying the menorah, the ark, that they carried on their own shoulders. They didn't want to put that on anything else. They wanted the merit. It says that the Aron is nosis, nosav. The Aron, the ark, carried its carriers. It, they didn't carry it. It carried them. They thought that they were holding it up on their shoulder, but really they were being carried by it. You know, many times when you do something out of love, you see that it's not a burden anymore. You think it's a burden. It looks like a burden. But then when you actually do it, you see that it's much greater. And it's a gift to you, not a gift to them. Like someone who's fortunate to give charity. Many times people think like, oh, look at me. I'm giving to them. No. They're giving you the privilege and the opportunity to support them and to give charity. 
So th- this is the the importance of recognizing that my, my grandfather, I remember I would walk home with him from shul many times. I would offer, my grandfather was already in his late 80s, and I would offer to carry home his tefillin for him, and he would never let me. He says He would say, the Aron is nose es nosav. The Aron, the Ark, carried its carriers. He says his tefillin carry him. It's not him carrying the tefillin. That's an excellent question. Thank you. That's a great question. Let me give you just a quick timeline. The Jewish people left Egypt Passover, right? That is an incredible time. 50 days later, they're standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and they receive the revelation. They get the Ten Commandments, the declared by the Almighty. Forty days later, Moshe descends from the heavens down the mountain and brings the physical tablets. So we have a physical gift from the Almighty. He breaks it on the 17th of Tammuz when he sees, upon descending, that there's a golden calf. Those pieces are collected and put into the ark, which is later. Forty days later, he says, okay, guys, it's time for us to to really kick it up a notch. And therefore, he goes up to the heavens to get repentance, to get atonement for the Jewish people. That's the first day of the month of Elul. First day of the month of Elul, which is why we blow the shofar, because it it's the same shofar that was blown back then when Moshe says, guys, don't mess this up again. You messed it up round one, round two now. Every day, they blew the shofar to remind people, no mistakes this time. Moshe is asking on our behalf. Forty days later is Yom Kippur, and on Yom Kippur, we receive full atonement. The next day, the Jewish people start donating for the temple, for the vessels. It was a two-day fundraiser. After two days, Moshe says, stop, stop, stop. We have enough money. No more, no more. Right? Like, imagine an organization did that, right? I imagine. So they they stopped the fundraising. Hanukkah time is when everything was ready, which is the 25th of Kislev, which only became the Hanukkah festival a few hundred years later. Then on the 23rd of Adar, they start doing the practice runs, seven days. On the first day of Nisan, the Mishkan is inaugurated. It's, again, the year after they left Egypt. And for 12 days, each of the tribes bring their offerings. Okay, so now you know the rest of the story. So, very good question. When the Jewish people were leaving Egypt, they were all busy collecting all of the riches from the Egyptians, except for Moshe. Moshe was busy collecting acacia wood, which was going to be needed for the temple. Oh, it's a big tree. Yeah, solid, big tree. And that was the wood that was used for the temple. So when the Jewish people left Egypt, they didn't only leave with riches, they left with all of that wood that they were going to need for the temple. That's correct. They were carrying all that wood. They were, they were massive, massive undertaking. Yep. Now, Moshe did one other thing, which was he, he was also collecting the bones of Joseph. Have an amazing Shabbos.